I want to thank you so much for coming in, and um, we are so grateful to have you here on the traditional territory of the Hussainic people, and it's just amazing to have you come again. It's so exciting. Uh, I think everyone on behalf of IGS9 oh. is just so honored to have you here. You're amazing. Oh, thank you. Oh, look at that. I'm blushing. Thank you. So. Well, thank you for having me back. Today we're going to drop some genetics. Like, this is really fun. So last time we were talking about archaeology. There are some archaeological slides just because, you know, they have to be there. But we're going to go really hard science on you today. Um, because, you know, this is the thing is that it's what, honestly, what I was so excited about when I learned about your, like, IGS and what you guys do here is that paleoanthropology, so, like, what I study is very interdisciplinary. Like, in the sense, on the one hand, I'm an archaeologist, right? So I go dig things up. On the other hand, I'm an anthropologist, so I need to understand about culture and social organization and hierarchy and different ways that people live, things like religion, all that kind of stuff. But then, this is the other thing too, is that, so technically it's social sciences, right? But as social sciences, we draw on very hard science in order to help answer our questions. So again, things like we talked a little bit last time about different dating methods, right? So I mean, we're actually using like radioactivity and chemistry and all these different things when we're using that. And then one of the big ones, um, you know, honestly, I think genetics is gonna be one of the biggest game changers in your lifetimes. Um, it's already literally rewritten human history in the last like decade. <laughs> so it's literally changing everything. Um, and this is where, again, it's, it's such a powerful tool. But so for the social scientist, we need to learn to go over and hang out and dabble on this side as well. And so there's just all these crazy fields that you need to draw on. And that's literally what they are teaching you how to do here, is how to bring all of these fields together, how to think across them. And then imagine what possibilities can happen. Um, because that's the thing is traditionally academia tends to be more like what we use the word siloed. So do you know what a silo is like, you know, on a, on a farm, right? So that, you know, the archaeologists are here and they don't talk to the geneticists over here who don't talk to the climate people. And so they miss all these opportunities, right? And that honestly, going forward, the type of learning you're doing here is what's going to change the world. Um, it's not the traditional style of everybody keeping their stuff to themselves. So it's exciting to come and share with you. Um, so last time, yeah, I was more the archaeologist. Um, I, I'm totally bad with this remote. So I get an F for that. Um, you know, last time I was an archaeologist, but this time I'm here as a junior geneticist because I am not nearly as into it and aware of everything as my wonderful colleagues are. But that's the key too, right? You you recruit people to come collaborate with you who are like world leaders in what they do. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about a project today where I've done just that. And you've already met one of my future collaborators, Keolu. You met him in his TED talk that you saw earlier. So I mean, that dude's fierce, hey? he's fun. Um, so you know, that's the thing. You go find all these fun people who wanna do things with you and then literally you get to go off and have adventures. It's really cool. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is the genetic side of it and why it really is totally game changing. Okay, so. Back to our slide from last time, just to reorient you. So this is the haplogroup that changed the world. And that haplogroup, of course, is the L3 haplogroup, which, if you remember, was the one I was explaining, literally are the ancestors of everybody who left Africa and who's alive today. If your ancestors left Africa between 50 and 70,000 years ago, you come from the L3 group right here in East Africa. And that's, again, when we were talking about what a small group of people it was, because using genetics, we can tell how many people left, how many people were interbreeding, what was happening. And it really looks like there was about 10,000 people left total, and that those people are the ancestors of everyone whose ancestors left Africa. So think about how small a group that is. Like, that's crazy how closely related everybody is. Um, in fact, I mean, there's more, they talk about this in the field. There is more diversity between two chimps in the same chimpanzee troop than there is between me and somebody from Asia. So I mean, literally, like the amount of closeness, genetically speaking, which is also why it's completely ridiculous when we talk about those teeny tiny 0 0.0001 of a difference in our DNA. And it's crazy we make such big deals of things, right? Um, so again, we can even talk about things like skin color, which are a genetic thing which has more to do with how much, where are you on the planet? 
if you're near the equator and you're getting lots of sunlight, you only need so much melatonin to help with vitamin D conversion. You get up to the north where you know, it's dark for like six months of the year and the sun's much less powerful, the lighter your skin, the better you are at absorbing the light when you have access to it and creating vitamin D. So there's nothing to do with anything other than where you're located on the planet. It's just that because evolution's slow, it takes a while. But if I were to move to Africa, and my descendants lived in Africa for long enough, we would probably see our skin would start to darken naturally over time as a response to the sun and our location on the planet. And so this is the thing. It's crazy that we make these, these huge important differences when literally they're just this physiological reaction to sunlight. But anyways, there's my rant. Um, the L3 haplogroup comes from L. L is literally the ancestor, I'll give you one second, of everybody who's alive today, whether it's the Khoisan who went this way, whether it's our ancestors, for those of us who left who went that way, or the ones who went down to the south. And what they think may have happened is that they think there may have been a genetic bottleneck, it's called. So a genetic bottleneck is basically when a species almost goes extinct. Do you remember when you were learning about the bison in that other video you watched? Exact same thing happened to humans, actually. So humans have come really close to the line a couple times. They think what happened there was about 75,000 years ago, and it's called the Mount Toba supervolcano. And I don't know if how many of you know this, but you know when the supervolcano explodes, it literally can take out the sun, right, for several years. And that is what happened around 75,000 years ago. And so they think that potentially it wiped out any other groups of humans who actually may have left like before then, or brought them down to the point where they never, they never managed to make it kind of thing. They went locally extinct. So very important haplogroup. When we're talking about the haplogroups, we're talking about uh, mitochondrial DNA, which Joanna tells me you guys have talked about, which is great. Um, and so of course, mitochondrial DNA comes from your mom, and this is what we find from everybody. And um, let's talk about why we use mitochondrial DNA. But before we do that, yes, your question. So you said if your ancestors, you moved to Africa and you continued to enter, how long does that take? Um, I mean, it could take like, it could easily take like, you know, 50,000, 100,000 years. It's, so, evolution's very slow. And you know, this has been like a very slow process. So that's the problem. We have so much, you know, when you want to talk about things like gluten problems or lactose intolerance, we have literally asked the human body to take hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. And in 10,000 years, we've said, we are going to change your diet. We're going to change your lifestyle. We're going to stick you in this different place. And you just have to adapt. And our poor bodies are like, we're doing our best. But you know, there's a reason why we're, we, we were not adapted for all these things, right? We were eating very different food 10,000 years ago. Now, doesn't mean we're, we're fairly flexible. We're omnivorous. We can handle it. But it makes sense as to why some of us do have problems with some of those things, right? So good one. Yes? So this is something that's pretty Oh, absolutely. See, so the way evolution works is this, which is that a lot of times there's like a trait just floating around in some people's bodies in a population, which under, like, I'll use the example of, we'll use raccoons. We'll use raccoons with, some of them have really good thumbs for climbing trees, some do not. They're hanging out, it's all good, there's lots of fruit on the ground, life is great. The environment turns, like something happens, there's a catastrophe, now there's only fruit in the trees. Some of the raccoons really suck at climbing trees. They're not going to get the fruit anymore. The little guys who had the good thumbs where it didn't matter before, suddenly that trait that they just had floating around the population that didn't seem important is literally like the make or break with them being able to eat. So often it's traits, there's things like that that happen, that it's, it's things that are already floating around in the variety of genes that we all have, because we often have different versions of genes. And you know, in regular life, when things are normal, oftentimes these things just don't come up. It's not a problem, right? But then suddenly something will change, and this certain variant will suddenly become a very useful variant, right? Kind of like, um, I mean, even with COVID-19, there's certain genetic expressions, and I'm even going to show you one, that make people more susceptible to getting COVID-19 worse than others. And so suddenly, something which was completely irrelevant, you know, 15 months ago, <laughs> became really important, right? And that's often how these things work. Now, again, thanks to our modern civilization, we are able to 
overcome a lot of that type of evolutionary stuff, right? Kind of like if somebody has type 1 diabetes, we can now provide them with insulin. So we actually use culture and medicine as an overlay to actually combat, in a way, natural selection and other things like that. We're able to actually push back, which is kind of fun. So, but yeah, no, it absolutely could just be floating around in the gene pool, and you might not even know it. You might pass it on, and suddenly it becomes useful, and the body triggers it. And So it's funny, isn't it? So, Okay, so why do we use mitochondrial DNA. Okay, well, for one thing, it is a simpler version, as you've probably learned, right? So that mitochondrial DNA is not, it's not as complex as like nuclear DNA, right? So nuclear DNA is the main DNA. You find the nucleus of the cell. Mitochondrial DNA is this sort of little, these little circles, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, so we use them for that reason because they are easier to reconstruct. We also use them because they mutate regularly. I don't know if you talked about that at all. OK, so often, like well, as with any genes, they, they often mutate. And these mutations just sort of happen over time. Mitochondrial DNA, for whatever reason, it, it mutates very regularly. Um, and so again, we can actually mark when these mutations take place. And it allows us to figure out who's the ancestor of who based on what mutations have happened and which ones have not. So it's very convenient for building like a lineage or building sort of an ancestry. We can see what which things are taking place over time. So this is why we use it. Um, now apparently, you touched on it, but we didn't, we didn't talk about the great oxygenation event of 2.4 billion BC, um, <laughs> which I was like, well, we got to talk about it just because it's so cool. Again, I'm not an expert at this, but I always just found it so interesting about like, how mitochondria ended up inside of our cells, which this is the thing, is that um, Mitochondria, most likely, now it's not 100%, but they're fairly sure that mitochondria, once upon a time, used to actually be a standalone creature, which is crazy. Like it was actually floating around in the primordial soup of our oceans by itself, minding its own business, when something very inconvenient happened called the cyanobacteria came along and started pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. Before that, there was no oxygen. Oxygen did not exist, which is crazy because everything alive today needs oxygen. So it's actually a bit of a mind bend to try and imagine a complete world, including living organisms, that hate oxygen. Um, so this is where, with the cyanobacteria, they leave behind these cool things called stromatolites, um, stromatolites which um, are basically the lime that they exude. And you can find fossil versions, so we can tell based in geology, like when they show up. And shortly thereafter, things like the mitochondria um, basically are like, ah, there's oxygen, we're burning. So you know, basically, there's this entire set of life forms that are gone now. And so this is where the line is. And then what we see happen is here's our friendly little neighborhood mitochondria right there. What it did, it came up with a deal with this other type of bacteria, basically. Um, like so the other cell type that was able to handle oxygen, it said, look, if you let me come live inside of you, I will provide you with power and in exchange you will protect me from the oxygen. So isn't that strange? Like we're technically every single cell in our body is like this weird symbiotic relationship. And we actually have tiny creatures living inside of us. But now they're part of us and they can live on their own. But I just had to I just had to explain because I thought it was just so cool that I was like, this is where this is why though it has its own DNA rings. So that again, here's here's your typical cell, right? Here's a little mitochondria in there doing its job, passing off power to your cell. And inside of there, you find these little rings of DNA. But because it's, it's, it's own, used to be, it used to be a separate sort of single-celled organism, now we have these simpler, shorter chains of genetic material that we can rebuild from, is basically what it is. And it's a lot less complicated than the massively complex human genome. And so that's one of the reasons why they like to use it. For sure. At least it wasn't me screwing it up this time. This is like a first. Sorry. No, it's all good. Um, I will just touch nothing. <laughs> yeah. but, so does that make sense? This is some pretty heavy science, hey? I'm, I'm impressed that you're handling it so well. This is normally like university level stuff. So well done. I figured you guys could take it. OK. Is that where we were? No, that's actually a different PowerPoint. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this time, that's OK. Sorry. No, it's all good. Um, I'm trying to remember what was on my next slide after that. 
So talking about mitochondria, I think we basically did it. Yeah, we talked about it. It's all good. Um, and I was going to start showing you some cool examples. There it is. Yay. Of how we actually apply mitochondria. Yeah. So why did the other cell, why was the other cell able to handle oxygen if oxygen didn't exist before them? Again, it was probably one of those ones where that trait was floating around inside of it, not useful until cyanobacteria started pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. And then the ability of that other cell to actually um, absorb it and work with it allowed it to survive, whereas anything that didn't run for cover basically inside the other ones um, would have gone extinct basically. So there was a huge die off of stuff and only a very few ones like mitochondria um, and some of the cyanobacteria actually went inside some of the cells too, but that's a whole other story. But yeah, so no, it's this really cool, weird, symbiotic thing that happened around two billion years ago. So it's kind of fun. So one second, I'll get to you. Yeah? When cell division occurs, yeah. the mitochondria is duplicated as well as the yes. section of the cell. How does that work? Because we've already established that they're different organisms. Doesn't it hurt your head? <laughs> yeah, she's asking how, <laughs> I know. And that's, I mean, this is not, like my area. This is one of the ones where I dabble. I put my foot in. Um, my understanding is, is that they're now considered to be what's called an organelle, which means that they're now more, am I, am I covering this right? I mean, honestly, Joanna could probably do a better job of explaining it than me. Um, but that, you know, that literally they're, they're now part of our body because they couldn't survive on their own. And this has been like, you know, two billion plus years later. I think they've kind of worked out how to do this whole process. But yeah, it is, it is a very cool, very weird thing to actually think of yourself as being a symbiotic creature that way, isn't it? So I kind of like it, but yeah. Evolution seems to be a series of happy accidents. It's a total set of happy accidents. Yeah, no, literally things zig and zag and you yeah, don't really know what's going to happen. Just yeah. To one day be yeah. Yeah, totally. Or like an asteroid falls out of the sky and suddenly there's room for our tiny little furry ancestors, right? So yeah, no, it's, it's funny how that works. Yeah. I know, yes, we're kind of like humanizing it and giving it the ability uh, to negotiate and stuff too, yes. Uh, received energy from the mitochondria, yeah. um, which ate off, it was like a symbiotic relationship. Yes, then, yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it is. is yeah, it's, it's a very mutually beneficial arrangement. The mitochondria is protected from the oxygen, and in exchange it provides power. So, And it gets food, like it gets fed basically by the cell and provides the power in exchange. So, no, it was a good gig. It worked it out well. And like I said, like, Almost everything went extinct. It was one of the big extinction events, like probably the first one. And then, um, but yeah, so that's where, that's why though we're able to actually treat mitochondrial DNA as a separate entity though, um, and why it's often easier for us is because it is these little tiny rings as opposed to our incredibly complex genome. Okay, so why might mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA be useful for studying paleoanthropology? Give me some ideas, and then I'm going to show you a whole bunch of things. So why, might, why would it be handy? Why would us paleoanthropologists care about knowing about genetic stuff? Why is it useful? So yeah. Isn't the mitochondria one of the first uh, parts of the cell that dies when uh, an organism dies? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, it degrades. Like, it sort of all breaks down, I think, about the same pace. But what could we use it for, though? What would be useful to use it for? So I thought. Did if you use the nuclear DNA, you can get the exact like cell or like bone structure and everything. So we might be able to figure out some physical traits, yeah, yeah. By telling, well, by looking at the long term, like the nuclear DNA, DNA mutations, you can tell what range it is. But if it, if mitochondria DNA evolves every so often, super yeah. frequently, then you can tell what it is more accurately. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we can be more accurate. Um, potentially, also, we can be more accurate with our dating as well. Right? So this is the thing, I was talking to a couple of my paleoanthropology friends and I was like, dude, you could actually use this to date things. Like, because again, it, the mutations happen so regularly and you have such a full library now. And it was really funny that they hadn't thought of it. <laughs> Whereas I talked to my geneticist friends and they were like, well, yeah, of course you could. And I was like, yes, let's do this, right? So yeah, again, with things that are working in genetics, we can absolutely apply, but dating is, you know, we have so much trouble dating that far back that it would be really handy, so yeah. Where you are in the spectrum of where we diverge from the original however many thousand? 
because each family line will have a different set of evolutionary traits from the original mitochondria. Yep. So we can tell which branch you're in, who you're semi-related to, who you're really not related to. Yep. So the haplogroups. That's the term for it. Yeah, and that's exactly the L3 haplogroup is the one that left Africa. And then from there, it starts splitting into M's and N's and O's and P's and all sorts of ones. Yeah, and that's exactly what we can do is build a family tree backwards using that. So yeah, very good. And did you have a? Yeah, kind of. Uh, my question is with like this kind of um, DNA, could we figure out how the mitochondria might have behaved back then? Because I know, um, and its functions, because I do know that it evolves to, and that DNA also takes part in some certain types of organisms, the function and behavior. So how do you define that out? Um, I don't know if we can figure out that, because again, in, in the sense of evolution, honestly, even 100,000 years ago, it's kind of a blink of an eye. So you'd probably almost have to go deeper than that. What about something really straightforward? You've done such a great job of giving me all these really complicated ones. How about telling if it's male or female? Yeah. Right? <laughs> right? So how about um, you know, telling, like, say, some traits about them? Like, did they have... For instance, with Neanderthals, did they have the ability to speak? Well, there's a certain gene called the FOXP2 gene, which is very heavily associated with the ability to take thoughts from inside your head and make them come out of your mouth in a coherent way. Neanderthals have that gene, so they have the potential. So there's also all sorts of just really interesting things, or what was their, what was their eye color? Um, like, there's all sorts of cool stuff you can tell from that's also very straightforward as well. So when we're looking at, if you remember, Basically, we have bones and stones, right? And so if we're looking at the bones and stones, we need ways to learn more about them, right? To make them more, more like people to us. OK, so again, here's this other slide. I just wanted to remind you. So we've got people, we've got leaving Africa. These roots and the timing of these roots, by the way, is based on genetics. So this is based on looking at when these different mutation splits happened. And so exactly what you were talking about, who's related to who, when did it split. These are actually based on mostly on genetics, is on the splits, and then usually combined with things like carbon dating or other dating where possible or other types of things. But genetics is actually at the core of this, and it's completely changed our understanding. Even things like when did people arrive in Australia, that's based on a genetic determination of when their genes split from other people's in Africa. So again, these are about mutations. This is about exactly that. And so genetics is hugely powerful as well when it comes to things like land claims and ownership and understanding how people moved around the globe and when they moved around the globe. So there's a lot of power. And Kiolu, my friend that you guys saw, he and I were actually talking about that. Because you can actually extract DNA from dirt now. I don't know if you knew that. Um, he actually helped invent the protocol for that, which I was like, oh my gosh, that was he. I was like totally fangirling. It was really fun. Um, and uh, so you can do that, though, which is that you can actually now do a core sample at a site and literally bits of people's hair and skin and like whatever that have fallen off of them and just shed. They can rebuild from that now. That's the level of sequencing they can do. And they actually managed to sequence like multiple Neanderthals out of literally what we call backfill dirt. Like they dug it out of the cave and it was sitting in a pile. Like it was the stuff they got out of the way so they could dig up the good stuff. And the geneticists were like, this is a pile of gold. Um, so Kiolo and I were talking as well about the fact that you could literally use this to establish the genetic hereditary, like how deep people have been there. In Alaska, there was a really cool study where they were able to show that there are living people today who are direct descendants of people who were buried there 20,000 years ago, like full-blown direct descendants. And it's like, you know, so again, this has real world applications. But yeah, Kyolo is like, you know, if there's, he, was, he totally wants to come work up in BC. So if he does come up, I will bring him in so you guys can meet him in person because he's so fun. Um, but yeah, so I mean, this is the thing is that there's huge potential. We're using it in the past, but a lot of these things are also totally applicable in the present as well, right? So for this particular case, what I wanted to point out, too, is this little world word called genetic admixture, which means we're adding things together, right? And you'll notice there's the words Neanderthal and Denisovan. So by the way, according to the Russians, they pronounce it Denisova cave. And so I pronounce it the European way, which is Denisovan. But I know over here they say Denisovan. So as far as I know, they're both OK. But I just have been schooled to do it the Russian way. So just, yeah, but they're not incorrect if you say it the other way, too. OK, so let's talk about our lovely Neanderthal cousins. Oh. I know, I know. So, so, poor cousin Fred, hey? Um, <laughs> so 
Traditionally, right? This is what we thought what they looked like, right? This is the popular media, knuckle dragging, all of these different things. Well, genetics has actually helped us understand what they really look like. So this is a four-year-old child from a site in Gibraltar, and here's an adult male from a French site. So as you can see, they look a lot more like us, don't they? Right? Very human. What's that? The it could also be it's a little faded in here to see, but um, yeah, no, it's, but the, yeah, that's sort of, so what that is, is a combination of them doing like forensic facial reconstructions, right? Kind of like they do for modern like missing people's cases and things like that. And then what they did is they combined it with the fact that they were able to look at the genetic material from these people and show that Neanderthals had the same um, coloring as modern Irish people. So they were all red haired and blonde with very pale skin. Why did they have pale skin? Exactly, and they evolved up there. So over the 500,000 years since they split from us, they evolved lighter and lighter skin in order to be able to absorb as much vitamin D as they could during the limited windows that they had, right? And so this is basically what Neanderthals looked like, which is really cool. So this is using genetic information to figure it out. What I wanted to show you is on our third chromosome, I just wanted to point this out as one of many, many, many examples. Um, some good, some bad. In some cases, our interbreeding with Neanderthals has given us positive traits. Sometimes it's given us negative traits, right? So our susceptibility to type 2 diabetes, unfortunately, is thanks to our cousins. Um, they actually, they are more susceptible to type 2 diabetes, and they pass that on to us in an unfortunate way. Um, on the third chromosome, there is a particular gene expression that if you have the Neanderthal variant, it makes you more susceptible to getting COVID badly. And so some colleagues of mine in Europe were actually able to show that literally if you have this particular Neanderthal gene expression that you, you do have to be more careful of COVID. So it's interesting to see too, again, how this ancient DNA is becoming incredibly important for even just informing things like understanding you know, treatments and who needs to be more careful for things. And as we hopefully move towards more and more personalized medicine using things like genetic expressions, which of course is what Keola wants to do too, you know, that will give us the ability to be more specific, but those interbreedings with Neanderthals matter even today, so which is kind of interesting. So there's my random fact for you. So did you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, so based on we kind of have the technology now with genetic engineering where we could um, theoretically bring back a Neanderthal today. Oh, no. <laughs> a lot of ethical issues there. And I was listening to some just a couple. About it. You know, yeah. It would give us an opportunity to find out when and what, how we are different, maybe how we evolve conscious difference. Yeah. Um, do you think that in the, in the coming years, will the technology become much cheaper and widely available that will start bringing things back from the past? Honestly, I am terrified that somebody will. Um, this is a sentient being. Like, I cannot even imagine bringing something like that back, like a person, completely out of their social and cultural context, which we don't understand. We don't know what kind of bonding they had. or like, like there's, there's so much complexity to it that I think it would be really scary. And it's really ironic you mentioned that. Did Spencer tell you about the film he worked on with me? No. Okay, so in my other life, I actually do write and direct films um, <laughs> so, on the side. Um, and I shot my first feature this last year. Um, and my friend Spencer, who used to work here at IGS, helped me, actually. And um, it is actually about a Neanderthal clone in a biomedical facility. It is literally a narrative thought experiment of what would happen if you brought one back. Truly, and it's actually in the process of being edited right now. So <laughs> there we go. I, no, he didn't actually. No, he played one of the bad guys for me. He was great about it. Um, he was a good bad guy. He did a good job. But um, no, because again, it was one of those ones where I have been very concerned about it um, ever since I heard there's a geneticist in my field, well, in sort of adjacent to my field called George Church who's a big believer, he wants to bring back everything. He wants to bring back mammoths, he wants to bring back carrier pigeons, he wants to bring back them all. And he half jokingly talked about if he could find a, a human female who was willing to actually carry it, he would love to sequence and bring back a Neanderthal. And I was, um, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet him, and I know, I do, so I do know him. And I was like, that is absolutely terrifying. Just because you should, 
or you could doesn't mean you should, right? Like I think this is that's always the joke, right? The hard sciences want to go do things. The social sciences and the humanities are the break on let's let's look let's look at maybe why we shouldn't ethically speaking and morally speaking is it the right thing to do? So yeah, that was where it felt like this one wasn't something that fit into a documentary category. It was something where I felt like we really needed to see what would happen if you brought one back because they're not a person. And um, you know, through TED and stuff, I'm involved with some of the non-human rights projects. So like trying to get chimps out of labs and things like that. Because again, these are very smart, sentient creatures who should not be in labs being experimented on, right? And yet they don't, they're not, they're not people. So, you know, so that's what I mean. So it's a very tricky ethical line. So yeah, that's really funny. You should bring that up. <laughs> and you actually didn't know that ahead of time? <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. Um, theoretically, if you were to raise a Neanderthal as a human child, yeah. would it act somewhat like a human child? Or would Probably. it be a Neanderthal name only? Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, again, you know, keep in mind, too, we would have to scaffold it off of, like, a human ovum, right? Like, it would have to actually be built out of a human egg, because we don't have a Neanderthal egg, right? So it would only be a hybrid, honestly, to begin with. Um, we couldn't truly bring back a Neanderthal from scratch, because we need something to build with, at least not at this point. Maybe in the future we could get to the point where we could 3D print something, God only knows. Um, but for right now, you would have to use some sort of human... DNA as well, which is honestly would be the only thing that would probably protect it <laughs> from the fact at least it would give it some rights. But no, it's ethically very, very thorny. Um, and again, when we look at the way they interacted socially and even within their groups, like there, there are some interesting differences there. Like there are things about the Neanderthal sometimes when I'm excavating, like we're working at sites or we're looking at data where I'm like, you know, I feel like I am dealing with a slightly alien mind like the way they organize themselves, the way they seem to have done things. Sometimes it, you sort of bump up against the fact that you know we think of them as being human, but they're not. They're actually their own species that evolved off on their own for like 500,000 years, which means they may have evolved different ways of doing things. I don't want to freak you guys out too much, but there are some very strange examples of cannibalism amongst the Neanderthals, mm -hmm. <laughs> like large-scale cannibalism that I am like, this is slightly terrifying, and I'm not sure how to process this. <laughs> so again, there are things there which we just don't under We don't even know what we don't know. It's literally that. And so I think that was where we would have to, I think it would just be better not to. I even have issues with the concept of bringing back something like a carrier pigeon because other creatures have already filled its spot. And so to bring back the carrier pigeon, we're now actually having to displace something which has moved into and adapted for that. So now we're starting to mess with things and whole systems, and I don't know if it's a good idea. But that's not my area of specialty, but that would be my personal take on it. So, yeah. I mean, at some point, it kind of makes you wonder, the animals, through evolution, they kind of Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, it's a really good question. Because, um, again, you know, there's not really, I, think, I can't remember if I touched on this or not. I think I did a little bit. But there's really no evidence of violence between humans and Neanderthals. It's not like they were out there, like, fighting it out over the northern tundra. In fact, it seems more like what it might have truly been was that the Neanderthals just kind of partially interbred with us. And so in a way, they're not really gone, right? Like, um, oh, I should point out, too, just you know, to give you my lineage, I'm almost 4% Neanderthal on my mother's side. Um, and I'm 2.5% Denisovan on my father's. So I know. Some of my ancestors must have detoured through Asia. It's really cool. Um, but um, you know, so again, they, they technically exist. And as they say, like, this is, again, the cool thing about genetics, right? Which is that I might have 4%. Somebody else in this room might have 2%, but it could be a different 2%. What my, one of my geneticist colleagues was explaining to me was that about 30% of the total Neanderthal genome is present in, through our entire species. So a, a third of Neanderthals still exists. Would Africans that never left Africa, would, they wouldn't have any a few of them do because, again, people went back and forth, right? So there, there is actually some, but definitely you're right. There are groups down there that don't, and we will, we will get to that here in a minute because there's something really cool about that. Um, but yes, thank you for, you're, you're on the right page there. Yeah. So I'm aware that we are able to clone things in yes. a certain respect at this moment in time, like you can clone your dog. Yeah. Has there been any example of people who have already brought something back, something very small like bacteria or maybe something bigger like a pigeon? 
Oh. Been able to successfully, um, They're trying to bring mammoths back right now. They want to repopulate Siberia with mammoth, for better or worse. Um, and uh, I'm not sure, though, if they've successfully done it or not, to be honest. I could, I'm, not an, I'm not up enough in the field to totally know. Um, but it might be something worth investigating, because we're, like, we're on the cusp. Though. Oh, it's a and very slippery to, slope. Neanderthal right? Neanderthal armies, I know. Our poor Neanderthals. So, yep. Saber-toothed tigers, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, here one sec. We lost everybody. <laughs> oh, was this your follow-up? Okay. Let's get your follow-up, and then we'll go to you. What's stopping them from cloning? Yeah. Yeah. Any to your best that's that's probably the thing that's preventing people. Honestly, um, from a science point of view, um, they could clone a Neanderthal tomorrow. Like, it could be done. Like, absolutely, 100%. I have no doubt that there are labs out there that have the capacity right now to literally clone anything. As long as they have a full genome, they could clone it. Um, so what's holding people back right now is ethics. Um, and also the fact that, again, you know, when they were trying to clone, for instance, sheep, um, I know a lot of sheep died along the way. So again, just because they're capable of it doesn't mean it's going to be successful right off the bat. And again, ethically, that starts getting really complicated if they start birthing baby Neanderthals and they start dying, right? Like, it's going to, you know, it's going to get pretty complicated. So I think this is, I know, it's so sad. This is why we just need to not go there. Um, there are people in the field who are working on creating sort of like an international ethics standards um, around this. Like, some stuff already does exist and people have pledged to not do these things, but obviously, you know, as we were talking about, as it gets easier and cheaper, like, that's the problem, is that somebody could do it in their, like, backyard, basically, practically. We're not quite there yet. Yeah, right, exactly. Or, you know, it's like Jurassic Park, but for real, right? So, yeah. What if we will do some area for um, uh, this kind of people? Yeah. Uh, and then we will just leave them and see what happens. And then they will leave as they uh, lived in a, uh, like, a lair. Oh, like you're saying if, if we put... And, like, we will just replay all this, um, all this line of events. Um, I see what you're saying. So is she, what she's suggesting is if you brought back Neanderthals, but like let them like live on their own rather than kind of being... But here's the problem, is that we are a very complex combination of nature and nurture, right? Like, think about how helpless our babies are. Like, we're not, like, when a baby, human baby's born, they are not capable of hopping up like a baby deer and bouncing off. Yeah. Like, they need, like, years of care <laughs> before they can even, you know, use the bathroom properly. So, you know, I mean, you can't, so what would be missing is that the Neanderthals, without the social interaction and the nurturing and the being raised, you know, being embedded in their culture and in their traditions, you there wouldn't be anything there for them to grow with. Does that make sense? And that's, again, the problem is we don't know what their social structure would have been like or what, what, how they organized their lives, how they raised their, their children, that kind of thing. And so there's so much potential for a very slippery slope on that. I'm going to take two more questions, but then I have to keep going because I have so many examples to show you. So yes? Do you really have a pre-human mind that we could possibly simulate on a computer? A pre-human line? Yeah. Yeah, well, keep in mind that what they've been doing, of course, is tracking this all back to understand when did we split, right? And so the latest data seems to suggest we split from Neanderthals between 500 and 600,000 years ago from a common ancestor, and that the Denisovans split not that long thereafter off of the Neanderthal line. So we are tracing it back. Um, as Beth was saying in that video you watched where they were talking about that 700,000-year-old horse, we have trouble with DNA that far back. Like, there's kind of a point at which it's so degraded. And so being frozen up in the north was amazing, but that's not the usual conditions. Um, now, with AI and other crazy resources at our disposal, honestly, I think you could probably use AI to push it back even farther and to build that tree backwards. But, and I wouldn't be surprised if over time we were able to start sequencing DNA. Like, I'm sure it'll happen. Um, we just need third gen, right? We're not there yet. But once we get to that third generation, then sure, it probably could. I'm just going to answer him, and then I promise I will answer you next time, okay? I know. It's hard. Us, like, making, like, a completely artificial, like, 
prehistoric biomen, let's say, like, the middle of the Amazon. Like, it, it's, like, kind of, like, gated off, but, like, it's completely artificial. So Neanderthal Park, kind of like Jurassic Park? <laughs> so, 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 but yeah, the way you gotta look at it is that I mean, all most of us are a little Neanderthal, right? Like, there or a little Denisovan, or you know, other things, right? Like, so I think we're there, right? And I mean, and they were very similar to us. So I think we don't want to start thinking of them as almost being like lesser either, in the sense that they were just as intelligent as we were. And so, if they're fully sentient, functioning human people, basically, we don't really want to, you know, stick them somewhere and observe them, right? Like, that's not really. It wouldn't be very cool. Kind of like if we can't do it to humans, we really shouldn't be doing it to them, right? Is how's that? I would say that's probably the, the rule, the, that's probably the gauge we should use. Um, okay, so onwards and forwards. So the great debate, and this is what I want to talk to you about because I managed to talk Nat Geo into funding me for a really crazy experiment that we're going to go hopefully try and do, which is to answer who were the first artists. So. Of course, the question is, do Neanderthals make art? Now, art traditionally has been something that's seen as being very much like the bastion of humans. Like, we humans are extra special because we were the only creatures who make art, right? Like, that's definitely been, we've lost a lot of the other ones with Neanderthals because Neanderthals buried their dead. They put grave goods in. They did all these things, if you remember from my modern sort of symbol, symbolic behavior checklist, right? The one remaining thing that they had was that humans were the only people who made art, and therefore we were better. And so you can see a lot of this goes back into old prejudices against the idea of there being more than one, one species that's as good as us, right? Which traditionally humans have had a hard time with. Um, Pretty yes. Sure. The would today, so there would have been a war. There would have been a war. So maybe they're really peaceful, though. You never know. Maybe they would have been oh, the peacemakers. No, it is human nature. <laughs> we would have. We would have. We would have enslaved them. Oh, you guys, so pessimistic, so young. <laughs> okay, but back to art. So a few years ago, a colleague of mine by the name of um, Francesco Derrico was brought into a site in Gibraltar to look at this. Can you see? It's a hashtag. Um, and so this came from a site, this was only literally maybe 10, 15 years ago. And um, at that point, there was no art that was proven to be Neanderthal. But this site in Gibraltar had literally never had a human step into it. Like there was no ancient humans had ever been in this cave. They came in, they said, what is this thing on the wall? He, one of his specialties is figuring out if things are purposeful, if things were made with tools. Like all, so he actually did experimental archaeology. He worked it all out, and he came out and said, yes, this was purposeful, and this wasn't just them sharpening their blades. This was made deliberately. And so this was huge when this came out, because this is 39,000 years old when Neanderthals were still around. It's in a site that's only ever had Neanderthals there. And so this was the very first time that they said Neanderthals made art. And so people, there was a lot of people who are still pushing back to this day about that. Um, on top of that, people said, oh, well, it's just an engraved scribble on a wall, so you know, we're still better. <laughs> so, which has been sort of the prevailing attitude. Um, then more recently, I don't know if you heard in the news, it was a couple years ago, that they announced that they'd found these 65,000-year-old dates in some caves in Spain based on, can you see how there's these little white dots on the wall? So these are bits of calcite that's built up over the paint, and you can date the calcite based on the way that uranium breaks down over time. It's radioactive as it turns into lead and other things. They can measure how long it takes for that to happen, because uranium is naturally present in the limestone water when it drips down the walls. Well, this particular pieces of paint were covered up at least 65,000 years ago, because you know, that's when it was made. So it was 65,000 years or even older. So that, of course, erupted into a huge debate because there was no humans in Europe 65,000 years ago. Humans did not show up, if you recall, till 40, 45,000. So suddenly, we have, again, this indirect evidence that Neanderthals made art. And now we're talking about paint. And so, suddenly, and so somehow paint felt different than the hashtag. And, so, and there was three different caves, all of them with 65,000 plus dates. But of course, people have pushed back um, based on the dating method they use based on the fact they don't think Neanderthals made art, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where I came in. Um, and um, oh yeah, and so this is the kind of samples they scrape off to do the uranium series. And this is actually a very old red disc that's about the size of like a teacup saucer that's actually under this whole layer of that white limestone stuff that comes down and covers the cave. So it's very faded, it's obviously very old. And um, this particular spot's 41,000 years old, is what they were able to show, is that it was covered up 41,000 years ago. 
OK, so we've got all of this. We've got the debate that's going back and forth as to who made the art. And then, and I was sort of sitting in the middle of this debate. And then I was like, you know what? We have all of these things, like those red disks, were actually made by spit painting, right? So what they do is they put the red pigment in their mouths, and they go, and they actually spit it onto the wall. They do is for something very similar here with this hand. So what they're doing is they put their hand on the wall, they put the pigment in their mouths, they swish it around, and then they go, and they blow it. Why might spit painting be useful for genetic research? So I don't know all the hands. OK, just yell it out. Why is it helpful? Yes, exactly, right? So you know, here's the thing is that it's never, it's never been done successfully before. This is obviously the one researcher attempted it based off some pigment samples. But it's never been successfully done before. But we're right there with that second gen sequencing. So this is where I came in, was that I, I have some fantastic colleagues in Spain who control caves with 40,000 year old spit painted stuff in it. And I also have access to National Geographic, who I pulled the whole, do you know who Ernest Shackleton is? OK, so he's like an Arctic explorer. And he like basically advertised his thing with like there was a high chance of failure and death and starvation. And people lined up to go join him on his big Arctic, like his expeditions to the poles. But I did sort of the same thing with Nat Geo, which was I was very pessimistic. I was like, look, there is a high chance of failure. Like if you give me the money to go do this, well, like we will go try. But we might fail, because it's never been done successfully before. Um, and Nat Geo amazingly stepped up and said, you know what? Here's the money. Go give it a shot. And so isn't that cool? Um, so I literally, when COVID allows, there are caves in Spain. We've got five we want to target um, where there is spit painted art in the caves in the right kind of frame of time. There's also evidence of Neanderthals having lived in the caves and in the form of tools and other things. So it may be Neanderthals. It could be humans. But it's very, very exciting. Um, and either one would be awesome. Proving it was Neanderthals would be really cool. but. Even just being able to sequence human DNA would be amazing for all those reasons we were talking before, right? Like, was it a, was it a man or a woman who made the art? Um, what did they look like? Who, who were they related to? Kind of like we were talking about before with those groups, right? So who were they related to? Are they related to the people of Four Caves Over who spit painted that? Or is it the same person? Um, are they descendants? Like, there's so many cool things we can start to figure out if we can start building up a database of like ancient artists. Can we find a living relative? Because of course, Nat Geo with the Human Genome Project has like one of the largest databases in the world of like genetic material. So you know, again, can we find a living descendant of somebody who made the art? Wouldn't that be cool, right? Um, so you know, this is again where there's so many amazing things that we could do. We could also date the art based on those mutations, what's present, what's absent. So yeah. yeah. It seems very deliberate. I don't think anyone can deny the fact that it's very someone, someone did that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not easy. I have spit painted. Do not do it if you have something that you need to go do later in the day, because you will get it all over your face. I literally had like black and red like just down. No, it's not easy. So <laughs> those, those people were really good at what they did. Yeah, because it's not a simple thing to do. And that's, again, you know, so somebody had to teach them, right? So much more complex. Um, so that's one project that I'm so excited to go do once COVID allows and opens things up. Yeah. Oh, how do we know it's spit painted? Well, for one thing, it has that spray can look to it. And in modern times, um, some of the traditional landowners in Australia very kindly allowed some researchers from France to come and spend time with them. And they taught them how they do it, because they still do spit painting. And the hands look identical to what we're seeing on the cave walls. And so we feel fairly confident that, based on the spray patterns and everything, that it was being done in a very similar manner to the way it's still being done in Australia and other parts of the world today. So yeah, again, this is where the modern meets, right? But it's a matter of, again, they you know, approaching respectfully and asking if they'd be willing to teach them. And they, they taught this researcher from France how to do it. And he's probably the world expert at, see, he never gets it all down his chin. He knows how to do it right. Um, <laughs> so Neanderthals aside, we've also got, of course, wonderful. Have you ever heard of Denny? So Denny is a 13-year-old girl. She was recently found, again, from a tiny fragment of bone that this is like, genetics, right? Like, it's literally is a bone fragment that they couldn't even figure out what it's from. They think it's from an arm or a leg. 
using the second gen stuff that they're doing now, they were able to show that she was about 13 years old when she died. Isn't that crazy too, based on like epigenetic changes. So those are things that happen to your genes after you're born. There's environmental and other things that happen. So about 13 years old, she had a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovan father. She's a first generation hybrid, which is so cool. Um, and what's even neater is that her father's DNA though had deep evidence of a previous Neanderthal ancestor. So obviously these interbreedings were happening often. Um, even weirder though is that her Neanderthal mom was more closely related to a site in Croatia than to the Siberian site. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, so I mean, so all of these weird, like think about the cool things we're figuring out. We had no idea, right? And now we can figure things like that out. And she lived about 90,000 years ago. So again, this is partially based on mutations and all these other wonderful things. So I just had to show you Denny because it's su such a great example. Do yeah. you know how she died? No, not from that. Obviously it was not something that genetically would show. You usually need a little more material than that to figure out how they died. But, um, and again, there's so many things that are soft tissue that it can be really tough that far back. But I live for the day that we pull out of the permafrost, I hate to say it, but a human burial where they still have their skin intact would be amazing. We would learn so much, but. Yeah, so our mysterious cousins, I just had to point this out because again, the Denisovans we know even less about because we literally know the Denisovans from these tiny fragments of bone and from their DNA. We didn't know they existed until we met them through their DNA, right? This is a 125,000 year old bone from China which has engraved marks on it, making it older than the oldest engraved bone in Africa associated with humans. And my colleagues who found this bone have said that the skulls, there's actually skulls at this one, do not look human. And so they're trying desperately to see if they can sequence some DNA out of it and prove once and for all if it was made by Denisovans, but they think they might be Denisovans based on the location and the timing and everything. In which case they were making geometric markings 25,000 years before we even have evidence in Africa. Now they're probably doing it in Africa too, we just haven't found it yet, but it shows again that we have yet another species, a very intelligent, highly cognitive, symbolically capable people running around the planet in a different region because the Denisovans are basically based in Asia. So, yeah. Do you know how the Denisovans differ from uh, Homo sapiens or Neanderthals? And, like, are they closer to Homo sapiens or are they farther away, like closer? Are they farther away from Homo sapiens than Neanderthals? Okay, excellent question. So here's how it works, okay? So we've got our common ancestor five, 600,000 years ago. We have the split. We've got humans, we have Neanderthals. Around 450,000 years ago, Neanderthals and Denisovans split. So we're equally closely related to them in that sense, but the interbreeding is a little different because they went off and basically went to go live in Asia. And so the Neanderthals and humans interbred in the Middle East, like there's more interaction over the years, honestly, between those two until our ancestors moved up and into Asia, basically. And so at that point, we start seeing it. But they're about, they're equally distant because they're a split, they're a Neanderthal split, basically. What happened to the <laughs> We don't know. We barely know anything about them, right? Like, we literally have two bones. It's like, that's like, that's we didn't, it? except, and this is what I wanted to show you. Okay, so here's where the new bone was found with the engraving stuff. There's Denisova, so we got Kazakhstan, we've got Mongolia, China, India, just to kind of place you in the world here, right? So, but now we have this one here. Okay, they are very fashionable. You wanted to know what else we knew about them. These are Denisovan layers at the site. They were making jewelry. Isn't it cool? Like, look at this. Like, they actually were making like mammoth, like headdresses. They were making like, they actually were carving like stone stone bracelets, like, so we know like nothing about them and yet we know they were incredibly fashionable. <laughs> so, and there's also evidence of bone needles from 50,000 years ago at the site. So we think they were sewing their clothes. So we know nothing and yet we have all these really cool tantalizing clues, right? So you can imagine what we're gonna start figuring out in the coming years and as, because, again, genetic sequencing becomes so much more common, now we're not just assuming everything's human because traditionally they just assumed it was all human, right? And now they're like, oh, there's all these other species, right? So I had to show you that because it's incredibly cool. Yeah? Does this mean they might have had like a currency system? 
ah, um, currency system. I don't know if it was quite that far, but it's possible. I mean, again, you never know. Some sort of trading going on. Because that, that green bracelet is absolutely gorgeous, right? You know, and I mean, it's very well crafted. And it's like 50,000 plus years old. So it's from long before humans were in that part of the world. So modern humans, yeah. So it's a very, very, and it's from like a Denisovan layer, what we now know to be Denisovan. So, yeah. They don't know anything. Like, that's what I mean. I mean, if you want, we can appoint some of you to grow up and become paleoanthropologists and go to Asia and go study it. Because um, I guarantee you, there's probably more caves in that vicinity which have other evidence that's never been dug up before, right? So, I mean, that's the thing. This field, I don't know if I quite was able to get that across last time. Like, I basically know everybody in the field by their first names. Like, there's <laughs> very few of us who work in this field. And we all know each other really well. And, like, when I did my stuff with the geometric signs and it got lots of attention, um, I'm really lucky to be in this field because there wasn't a bunch of grumpy people. I actually had like really senior people in the field emailing me and saying, I'm so glad somebody finally did something. I've wondered about those signs. <laughs> but they're so busy with their own stuff that like nobody has time. And so there's literally things like a colleague of mine thinks he's found an entire new culture group with incredibly beautiful artifacts in the Balkans. And he's literally by himself excavating. Like, it's crazy. Like, there's just, and we're pretty sure it probably stretches like across this entire Balkan region. And yet, you know, there's, there's nobody to help him because everybody else is busy, right? <laughs> so as weird as it sounds. So how's that? It's a fun field. I know there's other fields that are quite crowded. This one, there's actually a lot of space. How's that? We have about five more minutes. Okay. So All right. Let me keep going then. I want to hit some more things. <laughs> So genetically speaking, I had to tell you, we talked about some negatives with Neanderthals. Here's a positive with Denisovans. Denisovans used to live up on the Tibetan Plateau. We found bones of theirs 160,000 years ago. It turns out they passed on to the Tibetan people a high altitude adaptation. It actually makes them better at living at high altitude and at basically um, the way they process oxygen and things like that. So again, Things we're learning more about the Denisovans from their, their DNA really than anything else so far, but that'll probably continue to change in the future. And this is where, I, when I was saying stay tuned, okay, there is something called ghost DNA, which is just the coolest thing of all, right? What that means is that there is evidence in people's bodies floating around today of at least two other species. We don't even know who they are. Like, we have no clue who they are except by their genes. We, they've left genes behind in us, and we know they're related to us in some way, um, but we don't know how. We have no idea. We don't know who they are yet. Isn't that weird? So we have no bones. We have no tools. We, we just know nothing other than once upon a time, somewhere, I think one of them was almost like along the way in Asia, because there's some evidence in um, Australia and Melanesia and in that part of the world of some ghost DNA there. And then there's also in Africa some evidence of several ghost DNA experiences. So again, I think the story is much more complicated than we know yet. And it's very, very, what we do know again is just this little amount. We're just starting to figure it out. I'm just going to keep going, OK? Um, all right. I just wanted to finish with a human example because it's kind of cool. Um, and it's sort of something I'm working on right now. So we've got a human example here from northern Spain. She, we call her the Red Lady of El Miron because she was buried with um, absolutely covered in red ochre. So if you remember from before, right, that's that red pigment. Um, absolutely covered in red ochre. She was in a very purposeful burial, lived about 18,000 years ago. Um, and because I like cave art, I had showed this is actually right above her burial. Isn't that interesting? So it's considered to be one of the potentially oldest grave markers in the world. Um, so isn't that, of course, it's a geometric sign. So I'm like, yeah, it's all about the signs. Um, so we got that. We've got her covered in red ochre. Oh, there's also evidence of pollen clusters. So we think they put flowers in her grave. So isn't that cool to sort of think of from 18,000 years ago? The big thing that's really neat is that we can reconstruct the ancestry in Europe based on she's one of the people they've sequenced her full genome. So again, her haplogroup, which now we know is the mitochondrial DNA, is U5, which makes her very deep, deep ancestry in Europe. But it looks like she came from the east. Do you remember those bone villages that we were talking about before? And we think she came from there and actually came across as the last ice age pushed everybody down. I personally think she may have been part of the group that might have brought shamanism with them into Western Europe. And so I'm actually using genetics to try and track religious origins. So you can see how you can really start to combine everything together to understand how people moved across the landscape and then mix that with like how the signs were moving and where we find them. 
The other thing about it, which is really fun, this is actually a colleague of mine was part of the study. So do you like my you? Is you can do something called a metagenomic scan or sweep, where basically you Good take. Good morning, oh. Claremont. Please stand okay. by for morning announcements in ten seconds. Okay, I don't have to take more than ten seconds, but this is the last slide, so we're good. So we'll we'll I'll explain it here in a second. Once you get your announcements. So thank goodness it is Friday. Hopefully everybody's having a great day and is ready and raring to get out to the sunshine for the weekend and the block or so. Just a few announcements before we break for lunch and a reminder that we are getting outside and it's been great to see every day. Uh, everybody getting outside and enjoying that weather and eating outside so that you don't have to have those masks on. That would be great. So five important ones today for announcements. Number one. All right. So in 30 seconds. So basically, you can do what's called a metagenomic scan, which basically was they were talking about that in the video, how they can get bacteria and fungi and like everything at once. So they did that basically with dental biofilm, ew, which is plaque. <laughs> and they were able to figure out from that though that the gut bacteria and everything inside of this woman was actually a lot like the Neanderthals and almost nothing like the people from the Near East who came up afterwards. So completely different microbiomes. Um, and what's so interesting to see is, again, using genetics, we know when people came up around 14,000 years ago. And this is what it did, is U5 is that woman. So she's part of that old European paleo heritage. It pushed them out to the edges. So again, the Sami, some of the indigenous people who still live up here, have a very high level of U5. The people who came out of the Middle East and brought like farming and Neolithic and agriculture with them, you can see where it's red and where it's not red um, as to how, how many people still have U5 or it's been replaced or pushed out, right? So it's interesting to see how you can see population movements. This is based on current day. Um, but you see right around the mountains, right where some of those cave art sites are, look, there's still U5 people there. It's, it's darker, right? So it's very cool to see the pockets of people that got left, but then also how farming and other waves of people moving in sort of displace those people. And with that, we did it. We made it through the entire slideshow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Phew. Okay, there you go. Not a movie.